nice wide podium. I love it. Thank you for that beautiful music. I count uh, Moonlight Sonata as one of my favorite pieces ever written. I love to listen to it and thank you for playing it for us today. Beautiful. Love that. Love that. Kind of keeps that left hand going quite a bit, doesn't it? Um, Mr. Call was mentioning a couple of prayer requests. thought I'd mention to you, um, <clears throat> some of you uh, from would know from Cincinnati, uh, Marvin Staggs. Um, I don't know if you remember him or not, but uh, uh, he died uh, last week. Um, last weekend, I believe it was, like uh, Saturday night or Sunday morning. And, um, he, of course, he had been suffering for a long, long time, been in hospice for a number of months. Um, and um, uh, the funeral was this past Wednesday. Uh, Mr. Kennebec, Richard Kennebec, performed that. Uh, and so I thought I'd mention that to you. A uh, longtime uh, member. I know he was a member of a quartet, barber, barbershop quartet uh, there with a number of, with uh, three others. And also, uh, you won't necessarily know this individual, but I thought I'd uh, mention it. I've met him one time when he was over here, but um, we had an elder uh, die in Zambia. Um, Mr. Darden, Larry Darden is our legal representative. He, was, he flew in to Zambia this week because some legal proceedings. And uh, as when he got there, he was informed that Mr. Nkoma, in coma, it's Wilson Nkoma, N K H O M A, uh, Nkoma, had died uh, of a heart attack. So um, he was 69, I believe. And uh, he had uh, been the one, he had just retired. Um, this year, earlier this year, retired. And uh, so anyway, you can keep his family, his wife in your prayers, but I thought I'd pass that, uh, pass that along to you. Nice to be here. Uh, see your nice, bright smiles and such, and be back and uh, visit with you again. Um, we were back here earlier this year. I forget exactly when, but we, we enjoyed it very much. Uh, Mr. Cole did write to me and ask me about staying over, and uh, it sounded like fun. I said, sure. And by the way, I, that Bible study on Jude, that should be interesting. I, I just, That one chapter, just going through that, is a really fascinating book, chapter in, in the Bible. So that, that should be fun for all of you. <clears throat> There's a passage that Paul wrote to the church at, at Corinth uh, that I've always, well, I've always felt I needed more understanding. I, I, I read, I would read it, and I would read it, and I would keep saying, what, what is he saying? What, I, I know there's more to it than what I'm, what I'm reading here, what I understand, what we've said. I just did not fully comprehend it. But I knew there was more to it than what I could actually see at that time. Well. Recently, a very good friend of mine gave a sermon on it, on that particular passage. It was actually two parts. Um, and one, the first part was more on the, along the lines of what I uh, understood. But then he gave a second part, and it was like, well, you know those aha moments you get? It was like, wow. Um, I asked him then if I could use his notes, and he would... Uh, which he very kindly and, and readily and graciously agreed that I could. And I wanted to share that with you today. Turn over, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 11. This passage here, yes, 1 Corinthians 11, we know, is ta Paul is talking a lot about Passover. We know that he's referencing the Passover and the Days of Love and Bread here. But there is more here than just that. Let's, let's read that passage. Examine yourselves, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. 
For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. We've always tied that to, yes, discerning the Lord's body before we take the Passover and, and such. But to me, there was something more Paul was saying. And, and he is. He's addressing much more. And I hope as we go along and we look through this further, you will see something more here that Paul was writing to the Corinthians. Paul is talking about discerning Jesus Christ's body that was beaten. Yes, we understand that. De beaten for us, hung on the cross, and then he died for us. We understand that. That is obvious. But can we see in the following passages from Paul something further? That the body of Christ is something else as well? Something more than just tying it to Passover? Let's look at a few scriptures first that we can see where Paul in other areas specifically states that the body of Christ, what the body of Christ is. Turn over to Romans 12 verse 4. Romans 12 verse 4. I'm going to go through about four quick passages here. And if you want to, you can just put them in your notes and I'll read them to you. Romans 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We are one body in Christ. Colossians 1, verse 18. Colossians 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, Jesus Christ. The church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He is the head of the body, which Paul says is the church. And he continues on in verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up my flesh that is lacking in the, in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Ephesians 4, he emphasizes it again. Ephesians 4, verse 4. Ephesians 4, verse 4. <clears throat> there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling. And he continues in verse 11 and 12. And he himself gave, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the edifying of the church. And then finally, look in verse, uh, verse 30 of chapter 5. He says simply, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are members of his body, Jesus Christ's body. So in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul is also addressing the church, the members of the church. He states that the members of the church at Corinth were not discerning the body of Christ the very church they were a part of. What was he talking about? The church, the body of Christ, are the called out ones. Those called by God, chosen, that he wants to refine, that he wants to purify. And as we heard in the, in the sermonette, that he wants to test, that he wants to bring, to prune, to bring to a higher level. He has chosen you, he's chosen me, he's chosen those members in the church. We are in the process of being refined, being changed from our carnal ways of doing things to the divine nature of God Almighty. We have that wonderful calling, that blessed hope. 
So yes, we are to pr properly discern the broken body of Jesus Christ. Yes, we have to do that. But we also need to properly discern the church, the body of Christ. This is about how we, how we respect and respond to one another. It is very, very important, and it involves discerning the body, the Christ. There are a number of times, you see, where Paul makes a statement, much like this, and then proceeds to explain and expound what he means. And that explanation sometimes takes many verses and can, can cross over into another chapter, sometimes chapters, as we will see as we go along. I'm, going to, I'm just going to, right here, just, just show you what I'm talking about. We're here in Ephesians 5. Man has put chapters and verses in. Paul wrote the letter, okay? It was a letter. Man put these artificial verses, these chapters in here. Let's look at verse 21, or 20, let's go 20, of Ephesians 5. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Paul makes a bold statement here saying this is what you've got to do. And then what do we read? We read about marriage. And it's a very powerful passage here about marriage. But if you continue on in chapter 6, because there wasn't a page break for, and a chapter break for Paul, he then continues talking about children. And he talks about parents. And he talks about uh, employees and he talks about employers. He talks about fathers. He talks about how that is to be applied. Submitting yourselves one to another. Yes, each one is a very powerful statement in itself. But Paul is explaining what he meant by submitting yourselves one to another in this passage. It, he was fleshing it out. And yes, when you read it, you can take each section out and you can read it. And wow, those are powerful words. But he was also explain, explaining what he meant in verse 21. So here we see in 1 Corinthians 11 that, G, that Paul is going to further explain what he means in 1 Corinthians 11. The members of the church in Corinth had a number of issues. They had uh, an awful lot of issues, which he identifies in his first letter. But he was encouraging them and working with them to show them how to fix those problems. He was coming at it from the perspective of, yes, you have this, but he says, he even says, such were some of you, but you are washed, you are, you, you are cleaned, you stand, you are sanctified, you stand here, before God, clean and sanctified. Verse 29, then, of 1 Corinthians 11. He follows this up, then. <clears throat> and he says, we're going to read this again, for... He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body of Christ. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. This has, this statement here has far-reaching implications. It appears that others, others people being healed may have to do with how it is that our attitudes toward each other what our attitudes toward each other has an effect on how God will intervene in healing individuals. That seems to be an implication that is there. This passage also addresses the inability of the members to relate to one another in a loving, kind, and concerned way. Verse 17 through 22 of 1 Corinthians. Look what he says here. 
Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse, he says. First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. But there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you, he says. Paul is talking about these other times other than the Passover. It's obvious he's talking about something other than the Passover. When they would come together, the church at Corinth was divided, arguing all the time, he says. They were not all going the same direction. In verse 20, he says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And when you come together, you treat each other in a selfish way, he says. Everything is focused on you and not the whole church. And in verse 21, at Passover, what do we do? We each take a small bit of bread and we take a small little vial of wine. Hardly enough to engorge yourself. Hardly enough to get drunk on. He's referring to something else completely here. He is not describing an he is almost describing an out-of-control potluck. If you think about it. Remember at that time, we're blessed here, right? We have cars. At that time, everybody was on foot for the most part. I mean, there might have been some wealthy who had a donkey that could ride a donkey, but for the most part, they were on foot. And it took quite a while possibly to get to the house or wherever it was they were meeting. Paul was describing a selfish and unconcerned attitude here that was disrespectful of others when eating. You got there, you, you went right for the table. He said, this, this is wrong. Let's drop down to verse 33. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another wait for one another when you come together simply put you are to be respectful and you are to be a holy congregation he admonishes them to come to, to come together in love and humility with concern toward the interests of others wait he says be patient be considerate of all who are coming you see, what Paul is saying here is that we all, I'm, I'm including me, we all have a responsibility towards everyone else in the congregation. Everyone else in the congregation. We are to treat each other in a Christian and godlike manner, always. In other words, we are to be unleavened at all times. We are to be washed of that sin of vanity and pride now Paul does not stop his thoughts here. It continues on into chapter 12. Look at verse 4. Now he starts, he takes a little different twist, but it's addressing much the same issue. Verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. God, God brings us together in a common bond. What is that common bond? His Holy Spirit. He wants us to be responsible to each other. What each of us does in the church should be for the common good, for the common benefit of all. Continuing in verses five, verse 5 through 7, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit 
of all. There are differences and diversities, but he says it is the same Lord. The same Jesus Christ is the head of the church of all. And the same Father of us all is our Father in heaven. And they are both working in us. But notice what he says at the verse, end of verse 7. It is for the profit of all. It is not for self-aggrandizement. It is not to make us look good that we have this diverse, we have this specific gift. That is not what it's given for. Verses 8 through 11. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Wonderful gift. To another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. But it's through the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another different kinds of tongues. To another the, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills, as he desires, according to what he knows is best. We'll come back to it in a minute, but it's very interesting that the, he mentions a gift here at the very end. We'll come back to it in a minute, the gift of tongues. Paul addresses that a little bit further. These gifts that we just read, read about all come from God flowing through the Spirit. But each gift is to be used for the common good of all. It is not. The gift that I may be, have been given is not to make me shine, to, make, to give me a puffed up head. That's not why God has given that to me for. If I have one, I, I believe that we all do. 12 and 13. For as the body is one, as the body is one, we all sitting here are in one body and has many members. Yes, we are many members, but we are one body. But all the members of that one body being many are one body also, so also is Christ. For, one by, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been born made to drink into one spirit. And he elsewhere says, whether male or female, whether it doesn't matter. We are all in one body. And, and through that one spirit. For in fact, verse 14, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Just because it says that, does that mean it's true? If the whole body is were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? For now indeed there are many members, yet one body. The body of Christ does not consist of just one member. It is not just Jesus Christ himself. Maybe, just for fun, maybe you are the foot. So that means you have good understanding, right? Don't get it, huh? Understanding, stand, foot, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, tough crowd. Oh. Yep. But we are all in the same body, but we are not the same as everyone else. I am not the same as my wife, but we are one body. We are united through marriage. We are one body. But we still are two different individuals. Each one in the body of Christ is an individual. And God has made that. And we can be so thankful for it. We all need each other. 
and we need what each other brings to the body. We all need each other, and we need what each member brings to the body. Paul writes that it is our Father in heaven who has put us in the body as he pleased. And if we question that, then we're questioning God. And if we see what someone else has and we want it, we're questioning God. We're not, we're not happy where we've been placed. We have to see that what God has given us is for, he's going to use us for a very special reason. We are not in the church to promote ourselves. <clears throat> We are not in the church to be selfish or to be disrespectful. Oh, this is not something new. This has been prevalent. This was prevalent in Corinth. Has been prevalent all along in the church. It was in the church in the wilderness. It's just part of our human nature, the carnality that we all have to face. We all have to fight and overcome. We are to be concerned for one another and appreciate one another. Appreciate what each one brings to the table, you might say. We are to be loving and caring for, for one another and thus allow Jesus Christ, through the Spirit, to transform us, to change us. We have that responsibility as members of His holy body. We have that responsibility to do this. Verse 21 of chapter 12. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow great honor. And our and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. One suffers. When, when we have, when we are made aware of a member that is suffering, don't we hurt? We go to God in prayer. You know, we have, you get bulletins and you see uh, num names and, and names and names. But you know what I look at, I realize this congregation knows specific individuals that are hurting. And you pray diligently for, for them. We cannot individually pray for 100, 200, 300 people around the world. We don't know them. We can ask God to heal them, yes. But what is important is that we know these individuals in our body here and around the world. Everybody has people like that that know them, that beseech God for their healing. And we can be thankful for that because they are hurting for those people in their specific congregation and hurting. But yet somebody is honored for something, 50th anniversary. We all, that's wonderful, that's great. This, this is the way it's supposed to be. But Paul continues on. 28, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healings, Helps, administrations, varieties of tongues are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But what Paul is saying here is what we just read before apostle, prophet, healer. God gives honor to all. And we each, no one is greater except the head, which is Jesus Christ. 
these these are not listed in some specific order of, of grandeur within the church that's not what Paul is saying here but then Paul still not through Verse 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts. He just listed a number of gifts here. But earnestly, earnestly desire the best gifts. But I show you a more excellent way. Now we're not going to go all through uh, chapter 13. But we know this as the love chapter. But let's look at the very core of what he has to say in light of what Paul is addressing here in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's look at verse 4 through 8. Addressing 4, chapter uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8. Love, he says, suffers long and is kind. You know this by heart. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. He is addressing some of the same issues from chapter 11 and chapter 12. That's what he's addressing here. He said, now, love is not this way. And then what, how does he conclude? But the greatest of these, now, now abides faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. I show you a better way. It's love. <clears throat> Love never fails, and the greatest of all these, including faith and hope, is love. But Paul is not through yet. Paul is still discussing this subject as we go into the next chapter. Paul is not through. Evidently, as I mentioned to you earlier, the Corinthian church had a fixation on speaking in tongues. Notice that that was one of the last gifts he actually mentioned in the list. You've, you've probably seen that. But it seems that possibly they had a fixation. Maybe it's because, and I don't know this for sure, he doesn't say. Maybe it's because they knew of how the church initially started in Jerusalem. How the Holy Spirit came down upon them as flames of fire. And then those present started speaking in foreign dialects and foreign languages and this was something that wow if they can do that they can be just like that I don't know if that's the case or not but Paul now tries to minimize that it doesn't say for sure but the members seem to be fixated on this gift as if it was the greatest gift and Paul has just told them the greatest is love, far better than this. Look at verse 12 and verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. If you're seeking a gift make sure it's for the church that the whole church can be edified and in verse 19 he says yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue what profit does that do anybody if I can say that and nobody can understand I have this gift it doesn't do any unless I've got an interpreter why do I need to have that gift if it doesn't benefit the whole church if it is not going to edify and excel the church whatever is done in the church should be for the edification of all 
not for the glorification of the one who has the gift, is what Paul is saying. Once again, this has everything to do with properly discerning the members of the body of Christ. Everything to do with that. Now, let's, at this point, give five responsibilities that each one of us has toward each other. Five responsibilities that we can derive from what we've read here. Responsibility number one. We are here in the church to love one another. I know that's a no-brainer, but we truly do we truly understand it? Do we truly understand that we are put in this church to love one another? Jesus Christ said these words as recorded by the Apostle John. I'm sure you can all recite it, and you'll need to turn there. By this will all know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. That's John 13, verse 35. We read that every night of Passover. We each have to grow out of our own selfishness and learn to express interest and concern, love for other members of the body of Christ. Not just other members, but all members of the body of Christ. Turn over to Romans 13, verse 8. We're going to read Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Romans 13, verse 9. For the commandments, you, sh shall, commit a you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment are all, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Paul says, what we owe to others is to come to truly love one another. That's what we owe each other. That's the debt that we need to pay to each other. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9. First Thessalonians 4, verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, and that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commended you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. In verse 9, Paul says there is no limit, absolutely no limit to how much love we should have toward one another. It should grow more and more and more. We are to grow in that love for each other. And then he says down in verse 18, Therefore, Comfort one another with these words. Paul, of course, is referring to, just before this, he's referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's referring to the resurrection. And then he states, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Be there and help. Yeah, you know, whenever someone, when you lose a loved one, we can comfort one another with these words. It may be you sit there and you don't say a word, but you're comforting that person. And eventually, 
you know, come around, and that person knows exactly what the plan is, but that person has to grieve. Comfort one another with these words. Be there for them. Peter addresses this, this love for the brethren in 1 Peter 1. First Peter 1 and verse 22. First Peter 1 verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Love one another with a pure heart. Fervently, he says. Diligently. And he says in Chapter eight, verse uh, chapter four, verse eight. Chapter four, verse eight. Peter continues, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. He says it again: have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. We are to maintain a constant love for one another. This is the opposite of gossip, tearing each other down and puffing ourselves up the opposite of that the apostle of love John continues on in verse verse 7 of chapter 4 of 1 John 1 John 4 verse 7 we're going to look at verse 7 and verse 11 in this one chapter here beloved he says in verse 7 of 1 John 4, Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And then he says in verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God is living in you and living in me, then we are going to have to love everyone. We're going to have to show love to other members in the body of Christ. And that is a responsibility that we have. Responsibility number two that we have as being members of the body of Christ, discerning that body. Serve one another. Serve one another. You can just reference this. Back to John 13. John 13, verse 14 through 17. I'll read it to you. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. This represents an attitude of humility and willingness to serve one another no matter who it is think about that night Jesus Christ stooped down he washed 12 pairs of feet one was going to betray him one was going to deny him and only one was going to be standing there with his mother before he died and he washed their feet he bowed down as this great servant. But this responsibility of service is not just for Passover. It is for the entire year. It is not just reserved for one night. It is not just a one-time thing. Galatians 5, verse 13. Galatians 5, verse 13 and 14. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Galatians 5, verse 13. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love so serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are not to use the liberty, and we are given great liberty. We are given great liberty in Jesus Christ. We have 
this opportunity, but it is not for self-indulgence. That liberty is not to shine on myself, to have my head do this, get all big. It is not for self-indulgence. No, it's just the opposite. We're not to be puffed up, arrogant and such, because God has chosen you and me, but rather to be, we are called to be grateful and thankful for that liberty. It is not for arrogance. It is not to puff us up, to show how good we are. And through that liberty, we are to serve one another, not ourselves. The next chapter over, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Thus you also be brought down, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is fulfilling the law of Christ? It is love. We are to be there out of love for each other, to serve and to support one another. But we have to be careful when we come to help that person that we are doing it responsibly. We are doing it because we truly want the best for that person. The edification of the body of Christ. Responsibility number three. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. One another. James 5, verse 14 and 6 through 16. Just one passage here we'll look at. James 5, verse 14 through 16. If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one, one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We all, we all, no matter who we are, have to admit we, that we are sinners and acknowledge our sins to one another. By doing so, by going to an individual, talking about it, they can have the understanding of where we are, where we're coming from, and what's weighing heavily on our shoulders. Then ask for prayers of others to help overcome what it is we are fighting. In so doing, we pray for one another. We bear each other's burdens in, in that way, and then the prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman will avail much with God the Father. That's what James is writing here. Pray for one another. We know that someone is going through hard times. Pray for that person. Take on, have, um, what do you call it? I can't think of the word I'm looking for. But you feel it within. Responsibility number four. Be of the same mind. Be of the same mind. In other words, we are to be united in body. We are to be a united body. We need to be stable enough on our foundation that any sort of division or discord or schism will not adversely affect us. We need to be united in that and not let division, schisms, discord, because God says that what he abhors is sowing discord among brethren. But we have to be of the same mind. We have to be united in that body. We are different. Yes, we are different. We bring so much to the body individually, but that doesn't mean we are yellow pencils. That's not what, what I'm saying, no. In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote that he is hearing of divisions among the members of the church. And he told them that that was absolutely wrong. He also told them that there are some factions that will actually reveal who is genuine. 
He actually says some of these factions are actually going to reveal who is genuine, who is right. Romans 12, verse 16. Romans 12, verse 16. Discussing this, this specific responsibility. Romans 12, verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another, he says. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. What he is saying here, too, is vanity. Vanity will destroy unity. Don't let vanity. God says, I hate vain intrigues. Don't let vanity destroy unity unity <clears throat> Romans 15 verse 5 through 7 just a page over or so Romans 15 verse 5 through 7 now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus verse 6 of Romans 15 that you may with one mind and one mouth Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. We all individually, each of us, me included, have an obligation to one another. A responsibility to live in harmony with each other. To live in unity. Then there is this passage in Ephesians 4 where Paul writes about the unity of the body of Christ. It starts in verse 1 of Ephesians 4, and it goes down to verse 16, but let's just look at Ephesians 4, verse 1 and 2. You're very familiar with the passage, but Ephesians 4, verse 1 and 2. I therefore, Paul says, the prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you to have a walk worthy according, uh, worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. He referred to a point. My my good friend did, and I wrote it down because it was very, very um, apropos. It's a very good one. If I'm all right, always right, then I'm not going to be in unison with the church. If I've always got issues, then I'm not going to be in unison with what God is teaching in the church of God. <clears throat> but if I'm willing to grow in understanding, then it's going to cause me to be united. That's a, that is a mouthful. If I'm always right, I can never be wrong, then I'm going, not going to be in unison with the church. Because the church has to grow and sometimes our little ideas may just be wrong they were in there before I have talk to my wife no don't do that um, if I always got issues then I'm not going to be in unison with what God is teaching the church if I always got issues But if I'm willing to grow in understanding, then it's going to cause me to be united in the church. Colossians 3, 13. Colossians 3, verse 13. He implores the church here in Colossae. Paul does. 1 Corinthians 3. 3 verse 13 bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you so you also must do it's not that difficulties don't occur oh they they do it's it's going to it's just going to happen it's that they must be resolved those difficulties must be resolved through acknowledgement bearing with each other, and then forgiving one another. In that way, we can be united. 
we have to acknowledge, we have to bear and forgive for difficulties to be resolved. Responsibility number five, <clears throat> build up or edify one another. Build up or edify one another. That is actually a direct command that we can see in 1 Thessalonians 5. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. First Thessalonians 5, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can be so grateful and thankful for that. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. Paul says we are to build each other up, encourage one another, always. Turn back to 1 Peter as well. 1 Peter 4, verse 9 and 10. Again, winding down here. 1 Peter 4, verse 9 and 10. Peter refers back to what Paul was addressing in, in um, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Peter 4, verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Be kind to each other, but don't complain about having to do it. Like it's a burden. And then also do it without judging or condemning each other. Be kind to each other. Don't complain about it. Help each other. And in verse 10, if you have a gift, he says, just as Paul said, use it for the benefit of all the body of Christ. Realizing that it is from the, because of the grace of God that we each one have the Holy Spirit and have the gift. <clears throat> Now, turn over to Hebrews 10, verse 23. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, Consider one another, helping them to, to love more and helping them to do good as well. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. We have not been called into the church by God for just what we can get out of it. That's not what we are here for. No, we are here to give to the church. We are here to give to the members of the body of Christ, to give in building and encouraging others, to show love, encouragement, to help them in, bu in building up good works. <clears throat> For the last scripture, turn back to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, and we'll read... Verse 15 and 16. Colossians 3, verse 15 and 16. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Peace is what? Peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Let the peace of God dwell in, excuse me, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 
If the word of God, of Jesus Christ, dwells in us richly, then we are going to be encouraging and edifying others in the body of Christ, other members of that body of Christ. We all need to be admonished at times. We all do need admonishing. But when we admonish someone, it needs to be from a spirit of deep humility with the very best interest of that person and also the church. Admonishing from the heart. And, it's, and it is for the best interest of the whole church. But it has to be from a deep within here, from humility, for a deep concern for that individual. This is that iron sharpening iron where we can help improve each other. That's what Paul did for the church at Corinth. That's what he was doing. He was helping them sharpen their iron. He was going back and he was, he was coming at them from the point of view of love and concern and deep humility. But if we are offended by a sincere admonishment, we must be careful because we can get stuck then in one place and never change and never grow in God's divine nature. We are part of the body of Christ. We are all members of that body of Christ. The body of Christ is growing. We must grow with it. <clears throat> so I would like to encourage all of us, me included, I'm talking to myself, to properly discern the body of Christ, his church, by showing that type of love, concern, respect and humility that God expects to see from each and every one of us towards one another. We are to have that outward concern for everybody. Who knows? Who knows what great things will come of it as God blesses us more and more for discerning the body of Christ properly. <clears throat>